We have learned that the availability of hormones depends on their secretion. Secretion means that stimuli may alter synthesis, release, or both processes to change plasma levels of a hormone. Three types of stimuli control secretion of most hormones. Neural stimuli, hormonal stimuli, and humoral stimuli. Click Neural Stimuli to begin your study. Some endocrine cells are directly stimulated by nerve fibers, commonly fibers of the autonomic nervous system. Catecholamine secretion from the adrenal medulla is controlled by sympathetic fibers. We will study the secretion of epinephrine in detail. Preganglionic sympathetic fibers innervate the endocrine cells of the adrenal medulla. When they are stimulated, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is released from their axon terminals. Acetylcholine causes adrenal medullary cells to release epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. The hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, reinforce the actions of the sympathetic nervous system. Any stimulus that elicits a sympathetic discharge, stressors such as pain, fear, physical trauma, infection, prolonged cold, or emotional stress, causes secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Click Hormonal Stimuli to continue. Secretion of many hormones is controlled by other hormones. The ventral hypothalamic hormones and tropic hormones from the anterior pituitary, thyroid-stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone are classic examples. We will study the secretion of thyroid hormone and cortisol in detail. Thyroid-stimulating hormone is the stimulus for secretion of T3 and T4. Increased amounts of thyroid-stimulating hormone act on follicle cells of the thyroid gland to cause more thyroglobulin to be brought into the cell where it is cleaved to release T3 and T4. T3 and T4 diffuse into the bloodstream. The primary mechanism for keeping blood levels of thyroid hormone relatively constant is a negative feedback loop in which free T3 and T4 in plasma inhibit secretion of thyroid-stimulating hormone. Recall that stimulus for secretion of thyroid-stimulating hormone comes from the ventral hypothalamic hormone, thyrotropin-releasing hormone. It is released in pulses that vary in a circadian rhythm. Adrenocorticotropic hormone is the stimulus for secretion of cortisol. Increased amounts of adrenocorticotropic hormone act on cells of the inner adrenal cortex to cause cholesterol to enter a mitochondria and synthesis of cortisol to increase. Cortisol diffuses into the bloodstream. Elevation of plasma cortisol is dampened by a negative feedback loop in which cortisol inhibits both adrenocorticotropic hormone and corticotropin-releasing hormone, the ventral hypothalamic hormone that causes secretion of adrenocorticotropic hormone. Corticotropin-releasing hormone secretion follows a circadian rhythm that causes daily variability of cortisol in the absence of stress. Stressors like those that elicit secretion of epinephrine, pain, fear, physical trauma, infection, Prolonged coal or emotional stresses also elicit secretion of corticotropin-releasing hormone. Click Humoral Stimuli to continue. Humoral stimuli include the concentration of ions and nutrients in plasma. The function of some hormones is to regulate these plasma variables. For example, Insulin and glucagon regulate plasma glucose, parathyroid hormone and calcitonin regulate plasma calcium, and aldosterone regulates plasma potassium. The secretion of each of these hormones is controlled primarily by changes in the regulated variable. We will study the secretion of insulin in detail. The primary factor that controls secretion of insulin is plasma glucose. As plasma glucose rises after a meal, Pancreatic beta cells secrete more insulin. As we have seen in our endocrine review, insulin acts on muscle, adipose, and liver cells to promote uptake of glucose and storage of fuel. This causes blood glucose levels to return to their pre-feasting values. Increasing plasma glucose levels initiate a negative feedback loop that causes glucose to return to the pre-feasting levels. 
This removes the stimulus for secretion of insulin. Note from your study of this page that the secretion of most hormones is controlled by negative feedback loops. They serve to keep hormone levels within a desired range. Eating a meal is the stimulus that initiates the rise in plasma glucose. Although blood glucose is the primary factor controlling insulin secretion, other factors also play a role. They include humoral factors like plasma concentrations of amino acids, hormonal factors like glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide, GIP, and activity of the autonomic nervous system. Click on the pancreas to continue. When blood glucose is adequate, an increase in plasma concentration of amino acids stimulates pancreatic beta cells to secrete more insulin. Insulin increases the uptake of amino acids into muscle and other cells. This causes plasma amino acid levels to return to their pre-feasting values. Increasing plasma amino acid levels initiate a negative feedback loop, like that caused by increasing plasma glucose. This removes the stimulus for secretion of insulin. Eating a meal is the stimulus that initiates the rise in plasma amino acids. The hormone glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide, or GIP, causes secretion of insulin. Click on the pancreas to continue. As a meal is eaten, the hormone GIP is secreted from the gut and stimulates pancreatic beta cells to secrete insulin. This is a feed-forward mechanism that causes an earlier and larger secretion of insulin than would occur if glucose were the only stimulus for insulin secretion. Both parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers innervate cells in the pancreatic islets. Parasympathetic activity increases insulin secretion and sympathetic activity, or the hormone epinephrine, decreases insulin secretion. Parasympathetic fibers become active in preparation for and during eating. Like the hormone GIP, this stimulus is also a feed-forward mechanism that causes an earlier and larger secretion of insulin than would occur if glucose were the only stimulus for secretion. Eating a meal is the ultimate stimulus for both of these feed-forward mechanisms. Sympathetic fibers become active in response to stress. Regulating the supply of plasma glucose is a very important part of the stress response when immediate physical action may be needed. Food consumption and stress are events that influence the levels of plasma glucose. Blood levels of a given hormone can vary widely over the course of a day. Normally, blood levels are determined by secretion. Hormones are not secreted at a constant rate. They are secreted in response to stimuli. We noted that cortisol and thyroid hormone are secreted in response to hypothalamic and pituitary hormones. Epinephrine is secreted in response to sympathetic stimulation and insulin in response to plasma glucose levels. We learned that secretion of cortisol and TH are modulated by negative feedback loops that keep blood levels within a given range around a set point. Negative feedback control does not imply constant levels of a hormone. We will look at the patterns of secretion of cortisol and TH to illustrate several concepts in control of blood levels of hormones. Click the cortisol secretion diagram to continue. Many hormones exhibit rhythmic patterns of secretion. A common pattern is the circadian rhythm, where hormone levels rise and fall in a regular pattern lasting about 24 hours. Cortisol, driven by CRH, has a built-in circadian rhythm that is synchronized with a 24-hour day by exposure to light. For people who are active during the day, cortisol levels are highest in the early morning hours before arising and lowest in the evening. 
Circadian rhythms arise from the activity of biological clocks in the CNS. They alter set point for a hormone, and negative feedback systems maintain hormone levels around the established set points for a particular time of day. Hormonal rhythms can be shorter or longer than a day, and they serve as feed-forward mechanisms. They allow the body to anticipate changes and prepare for them. Stressful stimuli can be superimposed on this cycle to elicit additional secretion of cortisol. Such stimuli override the set point. Click Continue to proceed. Unlike cortisol, acute changes in the secretion of TH do not produce long changes in blood TH levels. That's because there is a large circulating reservoir of TH. More than 99% of TH is bound to carrier proteins, and the total amount bound is three times the amount secreted and broken down in a day. Click the reservoir to continue. The rate at which hormones are inactivated and filtered out of the circulatory system also affects blood levels of the hormone. The liver and the kidneys are the major organs that metabolize hormones, and most metabolic end products are excreted in the urine. Some hormones are metabolized by their target tissues. Hormones escape from the circulatory system when they are filtered into the kidney tubules and then excreted. In general, peptide hormones and catecholamines are removed quickly. They are rapidly excreted, and they are easy targets for degradation by enzymes of the bloodstream. The measure of time for a hormone in the bloodstream is called its half-life. Half-life is the time it takes for the concentration of the hormone to be reduced by half. Most peptide and catecholamines have a half-life between seconds and an hour. We will look at insulin and epinephrine in detail. After insulin binds to its receptors, the complex enters the cell by receptor-mediated endocytosis. Insulin is broken down by enzymes present in liver, kidney, muscle, and other tissues. The insulin receptors can be recycled to the cell membrane. The half-life of insulin is less than 10 minutes. Epinephrine is taken up by endothelium, heart, liver, and other tissues. A single pass through a capillary bed removes 90% of circulating catecholamines. Epinephrine is broken down by enzymes and breakdown products are excreted in the urine. The half-life of epinephrine is about 10 seconds. Click the kidney to continue. Protein-bound hormones such as thyroid hormone And the steroids are not easily excreted, nor easily degraded in the bloodstream. Removal takes longer, and they remain in the bloodstream for a period of time between hours and days. We will look at TH and cortisol in detail. The thyroid hormones are broken down by stepwise removal of iodine atoms in peripheral tissues. Recall that the thyroid gland secretes 20 times more T4 than T3. However, the active form of the hormone is T3. Therefore, the first step of breakdown of T4 in the liver and kidney produces most of the active hormone T3 in the bloodstream. Other tissues, for example, brain and pituitary gland, produce T3 for their own use. Breakdown continues by stepwise removal of iodine atoms. The half-life of TH is several days. Recall that cortisol is a steroid hormone. Humans cannot break down the basic ring structure of steroids. Therefore, inactivation depends on altering the molecule. The liver is the primary tissue that inactivates cortisol. As the molecule is altered, it becomes more water-soluble, and it no longer binds to its carrier protein. It can then be filtered out of the blood by the kidney and excreted. The half-life of cortisol is about 90 minutes. Here's a summary of what we've covered. The chemical structure of a hormone determines its solubility properties. 
The synthesis of hormones involves shuttling precursor molecules from organelle to organelle or cytosol, often multiple times. Families of related hormones are produced when the metabolic pathway involves sequential modification of a basic starting molecule. The hormone produced by a given cell depends on the enzymatic makeup of that cell. Hormones that are not soluble in water are transported on carrier proteins. Blood levels of most hormones vary widely throughout the day.